Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Well, today we are going to be exploring breathing again, and I actually feel that Rick in exploring these kind, this theme of breathing, which is something each and every one of us do all the time and something we give very little thought to. So actually, I think raising it to a conscious level is a worthwhile thing to do. And for me, as I know a reasonable amount of breathing, I still find all of these discussions uncover new information and give me a, a different perspective. Well, my guest today is Patrick McEwen, and Patrick is the founder and director of the Training Institute, Training and Education Institute, the Buteco Clinic International. Throughout his childhood and into his 20s, he suffered with severe asthma, breathing problems, poor concentration and disturbed sleep. And on occasions, his asthma was so bad that it led to hospitalizations and an ever-increasing medications. Now, that may sound familiar to many of you. It's certainly familiar to many of my patients. Since first experiencing the power of the Buteco breathing technique, which he often says has changed his life for the better in unimaginable ways, well, the Buteco Clinic International is, is the result of that and Patrick's commitment to share that knowledge and his work with as many people as possible. Buteco, of course, was founded in Russia in the 1940s and uh, it's a technique which is practiced globally. We covered that in one of the first episodes I did in the Unstress podcast with Patrick and we discussed the Buteco. Today, we take a much broader view of breathing and uh, cover a whole range of topics. I mean, Patrick's long-term goal is actually to educate professionals, including yoga teachers, physiotherapists, speech and language pathologists, and dentists, especially paediatric dentists, about Buteco training methods so they can help their clients. Patrick's written some amazing books, The Breathing Cure and The Oxygen Advantage, and we actually do discuss aspects of both those books. So it was great to reconnect with Patrick. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Patrick McEwen. Welcome to the show, Patrick. It's great. Thanks very much, Ron. Good to be here. <laughs> Patrick, well, you're in Australia, so welcome. You're here doing courses. You've been doing some training courses for uh, the Buteco breathing retraining courses for instructors. Yes. You, you've yes, been so mentioning it's... that the whole thing has been going crazy. People's interest in breathing is unprecedented. Yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, it's really great to see because I know when I started it off back in 2002, nobody was really aware of it. And there was a lot of work in putting out the grounds, the foundations, um, even just to make a living. And it was one person, myself, for about 15 years, well, not even 15 years, for about 13 years. And, you know, putting out the information about nose breathing, the very simple stuff that we do, teaching you how to improve your blood circulation, talking about oxygen delivery, improving sleep, having correct and resting posture. And the most simple information was overlooked and it has taken off, which is great. Mm. So, yes, yeah, so we, we were doing a training here with, uh, with Mimbeam and um, tributecoclinic.com. So it was, it was super. Yeah. Well, Mim, of course, is a naturopath in, down in the Southern Highlands, I think. And yes. uh, she did for many years run breathing uh, workshops in our own practice in the city. And yes, I know you yes. also connected with another guest on this podcast, Dino Gladstone, yeah. the Bondi lifesaver extraordinaire. You know, yeah, he's they're, cool. they're amazing. He's great. He's so great. I, meet, I meet Dino tomorrow and yeah. uh, oh, yeah, well, so we'll catch yeah. up. Yes. Now, listen, as you travel around the world, um, what sort of, what are you seeing? What are some of the problems we're, what, what we're seeing with breathing? Because it's not something people give much thought or any thought to. What, what sort of problems are you seeing as you've gone around the world? I think there's a bigger recognition. I think the problems were always there. Um, getting breathing right is absolutely imperative for, for sleep quality and also for states of mind. And probably we are seeing a greater instance of burnout, exhaustion syndrome, high stress levels. And 
But we can't really differentiate or isolate one from the other because breathing and sleep and stress, each are feeding into each other. You know, mm. if your sleep is off, you, you're going to be pretty messed up anyway the next day. You're not going to focus. You're not going to be, like, I feel jet lag. So I know I'm not firing on all full <laughs> cylinders. Um, so if your sleep is off, it definitely affects your, your cognitive ability and your mood. And if your breathing is off, that's putting you into that increased stress response, which is going to affect, of course, your, your cognitive ability and mood. And there's a really strong link between even obstructive sleep apnea and insomnia. When they go together, it increases the risk of depression. But I think, Ron, one of the major failures in looking at people in mental health, because I know we're going to be talking about stress, is that psychotherapists and psychologists and people in the field who are helping these people with anxiety, panic disorder and depression, they are not looking at their sleep and they're not looking at their breathing. So how can they, can, how can they really help these people if they're failing to address two major factors which are contributing to their, their mental health issues. Well, I think this actually speaks to our approach to healthcare in general, uh, you know, a very reductionist model. But uh, you mentioned stress, and of course the program, is, this program's called Unstress, <laughs> uh, a made up word uh, which could be uh, to decrease the stress levels or just understand stress. But talk to us about the role of breathing in stress. What, what potentially oh, is good and, and bad? First of all, it's through your breathing you can change your physiology. Is there any other way to actively and directly change your physiology but through the breath? And there has been a misunderstanding out there because very often when a person is stressed or if they're feeling anxious, they're told to take this deep breath. And this deep, big, full breath can, it can impair their they're breathing from a biochemical point of view. Really, when we think about stress, we should be thinking about the speed of the exhalation. And just even focusing on that, if you were to isolate one simple thing in stress, when we get stressed, we as human beings respond with faster breathing and upper chest breathing and irregular breathing. And there's a direct relationship between the speed of our breathing, the irregularity of our breathing and upper chest and the degree of anxiety. And they've looked at this with students before performing exams. I was listening to a podcast by Dr. Rangan Chatterjee, and it's going back about a year or so, and he was talking to a brain surgeon called Dr. Rahul. And Dr. Rahul said, he said, what the first thing I do is when I get into a tricky situation is prevent myself from hyperventilating. And I was just thinking to myself, like, we know this stuff. Dr. Rahul knows this stuff, but very few people know it. Why doesn't a student going in to do exams know it? I was that student. And before I went into an exam hall, I took these full big breaths and I walked into that exam hall and I can genuinely, this is going back now, it's 1996, I can genuinely say I was sitting there you know, on the, at the table, my head was all over the place. I was disoriented, I was dizzy. I deliberately hyperventilated because this is the information that you hear. So coming back to then, Ron, a very simple tool that if you're feeling stressed or if you're feeling anxious, don't breathe out fast, because if you're breathing out fast, it's the speed of the exhalation, not so much the inhalation. You could have a fast breath in, but if you have a really slow and relaxed breath out, when you have that slow, relaxed breath out, your body is telling the brain that everything is okay. So it's almost that we're hardwired with the communication from the body up to the brain, that when we have that fast exhalation, the body is interpreting, sorry, the brain is interpreting that the body's under threat. And all the brain wants to do is to protect the body. And the same thing is happening during our sleep. So if, for example, we're too warm in bed, or if we have dysfunctional breathing during wakefulness, which in turn is going to, you know, we're not going to have great breathing patterns during sleep. So if we're breathing fast in bed, the brain is going to arouse us from sleep. So when we're feeling stressed, bring your attention onto your breathing. I know it's not always the easiest thing to do, depending on the situation but nobody will even know that you're doing it. And don't wait until the difficult situation. Start focusing your attention as best you can during your everyday life. And then when there's a difficult situation, you can automatically tune in on your breathing, take that soft breath in through your nose and that really relaxed and slow and gentle breath out. And by doing this, you stimulate the vagus nerve. It secretes the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is causing a slowing of the heart and the brain interprets that the body is safe. But there's also another aspect. 
In 2017, Stanford researchers identified a new structure in the brain, in the locus callosus, and it's spying on our breathing. So you can imagine that, yes, there is feedback from the body up to the brain, but the brain is also spying on breath itself. And if you're breathing fast, this structure then will signal or relay triggers of arousal to the rest of the brain and also arouse you from sleep. But if you're breathing slow, you're telling the brain that everything is okay. So then we have to ask the question, what about people who naturally breathe faster all the time? I was this kid, you know, like the first time that I spoke about leaving school, I left school at 14 years of age, never to go back. And I suppose it wasn't something that I want to be bringing up, but I'm nearly 50 now and I'm comfortable and I've, I've done all right in my career. And I wrote about it in a book called Atomic Focus. I was the kid who was not thriving because you're, you're required as a child to sit there for six, six hours, eight hours and be able to focus and be attentive to what the teacher is saying day in, day out, day in, day out. And your intelligence is determined by how well you do academically in grades. But to do well in grades, you need to be able to concentrate. You need to have an attention span. I had sleep disorder breathing, but not only did I have sleep disorder breathing, which is common when you're mouth breathing as a kid and your nose is all stuffed up, very high narrow palate. Look. Yes. <laughs> I had a very narrow maxilla, which of course, but I used to go over to Dr. William Hang in mm -hmm. California. So he helped to, to widen it. And also Dr. John Mew. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's coming back to society. Like you can have children they're required to do well academically. They're not being trained how to co uh, concentrate. And in order to do well academically, you need concentration. Education doesn't teach you how to concentrate full stop. But to be able to concentrate, you need optimal sleep quality. And these kids are being labeled as lesser intelligent, as I was. I went from the top of the class as an 11-year-old. We call it primary school. I'm not sure what you call it here. Mm, yes, no, it's the in same. In primary thing. school to secondary school, which will be high school. I went from the, the top of the class in primary school to the bottom of the class in secondary school. Mm. It's interesting. We did a program with respiratory pediatrician, Dr. Jim Papadopoulos, who said that 50% uh, that of kids diagnosed with ADHD yes. have an undiagnosed sleep disordered breathing condition. Yes, which you, we've been talking about this for, why don't, why don't parents know about it though? You know, look at the study by Karen Bollock, and she looked at 11,000 children in Stratford-upon-Avon, and she looked at their, their sleep from age six months to 57 months. So it was a longitudinal study with a large population. It was published mm. in the journal Pediatrics either in 2010 or 2012. And her conclusion was that children with sleep disorder breathing and behavioral sleep problems at age five, if untreated, they had a 40% increased risk of special education needs by age eight. And she spoke that it's during slow wave sleep and deep sleep with the young child that their brain is developing. But if mm. the child is having arousals or sleep fragmentation or having disruption to their sleep and even snoring, snoring is not good. That then in turn is going to cause the child and mouth breathing, of course, as well during sleep, the child is going to have a lighter sleep and the brain doesn't develop the way it should do. So I think any parent, if you were to read Karen Bonnock's paper, and uh, it's, it's an okay read, it's not too scientific, but it really drives home the message here. Yes, it's such, a, it's such an important one. How do you think, I mean, we, we've gone through evolution, we haven't had to think about breathing. What's gone wrong? Oh, there's so many factors and it's difficult really to isolate it. You know, if you think of our ancestors living in a natural environment, doing lots of physical exercise all day, uh, everything that we're doing was how we've evolved over that time. And then it all shifts. Everything has shifted. Stress levels, the food that we're eating, you know, it's, it's, there's so many different factors. Probably the diet is one of the biggest ones. And in terms of hard food versus soft food, lack of breastfeeding, um, there's lack of attention as well in many countries in terms of tongue tie. So if the baby mm -hmm. is, is tongue tied, the baby is not able to nurse from the mother and the baby then doesn't thrive, the mother is getting sore, and then the bottle is introduced. And the bottle, of course, is, is not going to cause manipulation of the muscles of the face necessary for craniofacial facial growth. I think in adults, the biggest impact is stress. And I think there's a genetic component. Like I look at my parents, 
my parents have w- wide facial structures and we all had narrowing like a uh, crooked nose because the maxilla is set back the mandible set back you have the jowls like jowls are really they're a health risk because they're telling you that the airway is too far back sorry the, the jaw is too far back but then the airway is mm. compromised but my daughter is missing teeth so she's got teutogenesis so here's in one generation to the next it's getting narrower so what's happening mm. what's happening the size of the human face you know what's happening the size of the human airway and what does that mean for the human race i don't know mm. but it is uh, as you say uh, in the last few years the awareness of this breathing is so important and you've mentioned a couple of mi- a myth there about um uh breathing into uh, when you're under stress, you know, breathe, take a deep breath. What are some of the other myths that, that you know, we've kind of inherited along the way? What, what are, how we got things so wrong? It's very difficult to, to know how we got things so wrong. I feel that the, the people who have been teaching breathing for decades have, have not done a good job. They've made a mess of it. Mm. And probably because they've been teaching it according to tradition. There's a guru and the guru is saying it's my way. And I do feel the original breathing techniques that evolved from the Eastern world, they did include the biochemical dimension of breathing, but that's overlooked. Like when I first came across this in 1998, my nose was stuffy. I took a breath in and out through my nose. I pinched my nose and hold my nose, gently nod my head up and down. And I could feel relief coming to my nose. So you can decongest your nose by simply breathing in and out through your nose, pinching your nose, holding, and holding it until you feel a moderate, strong air hunger, then letting go, breathing in. And even though rhinitis is so common, nobody seems to know about it. I always had cold hands and cold feet. I remember sitting down also in the early stages and actually breathing less air, which is the total opposite to what we normally hear. We're normally told to take the bigger breath. um, And of course, there's a very popular breathing technique now that's going around the world involving hyperventilation along breath tools, which is a stressor technique. It's an extreme stressor technique. But that can be done by individuals who are suitable to it. But we also have to think about functional breathing patterns here. So I remember slowing down my breathing and under breathing to the point that I was feeling that I wasn't getting enough air and the temperature of my hands increased. So we, when you, we think about breathing, the potential here is absolutely enormous, but even the potential just with nose breathing. So how come the custodians of breathing didn't talk about nose breathing, not just while you were in a studio, but also outside the studio, during sleep, during exercise? How come sports medicine scientists have not investigated nasal breathing so much? There's a few papers now coming out during sports. So even when we asked the question, what does your mouth do when it comes to the breath? So Ron, you're looking into the mouth every day. Is there any part of the mouth that's devoted to breathing that will help to improve the the condition of that air before it comes into the lung? And the answer is there's not. So the mouth is a whole. And yet, like I remember sitting at a conference with, and a debate came up and a medical doctor who was actually a professor of medicine teaching university students said there's no difference between mouth and nose breathing. And I stood up and I said, doctor, I says, there really, really is. I was that mouth breathing kid. You do not reach your full potential. If you think about nose breathing, it increases oxygen uptake in the blood by 10%. And that, was been, that has been written by Dr. James Bartley an ENT from New Zealand for many, many years. We've interviewed, we've just had, we've just done uh, an interview. He's coming, you know, onto the program as well. Jim is just a wonderful uh, ENT specialist. If you can just tell him, thanks so much, because he's an ENT specialist who is talking about the importance of nose breathing. And Mm. that doesn't Mm. happen. I had surgery on my nose in 1994 to help breathe, but nobody told me to breathe through it afterwards. And children as well. How many children undergo tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy? They're not getting respiratory rehabilitation afterwards. And there's a 65% worsening in their sleep within three years, unless nasal breathing is restored. So I suppose coming back to your question, Ron, I don't know, you know, I just feel that there was a major part of breathing that was overlooked. 
See, breathing is a little bit more complex and multidimensional. You have the biochemical dimension, which is focused on chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. So in a nutshell, if you breathe too hard and too fast, that the volume of air that you're taking into your lungs per minute is too much. That can cause a lowering of carbon dioxide in the blood. But it can also increase, well, it increases the chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. But when you have a stronger chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is the natural stimulus to breathe, the primary stimulus to breathe, your breathing is harder and faster. Now, it's a little bit of a, it's not so black and white either, because there are people with the symptoms of hyperventilation that don't necessarily have low CO2. But we still have to look at the physiology of carbon dioxide. What does it do? This is not just a waste gas that we breathe out and get rid of from the body. We always need a certain pressure of carbon dioxide in the lungs. And we need 40 millimeters of mercury approximately. Carbon dioxide it helps to open up our blood vessels. It helps to relax smooth muscle throughout the body. It's the primary regulator of blood pH. But carbon dioxide also stimulates the vagus nerve. And I suppose coming back to the, the theme of this in terms of stress, when we're teaching breathing exercises and we're having people underbreed, we're creating a feeling of air hunger. And sometimes people with anxiety and panic disorder have a very exaggerated response to that feeling of air hunger, and it drives them into symptoms. So our goal is that when we're working with a student, that we're gently softening the breath to the point of air hunger, but keeping that person in relaxation and not going into stress. And the way that we know that we're keeping them in relaxation is by the saliva in the mouth. Because when we activate the body's rest and digest response, there's increased watery saliva in the mouth. But if, for example, somebody has a background of anxiety or especially panic disorder, that air hunger can put them into that fight or flight response. Now, and their mouth will go dry and their hands go cold. We still work with them because it's really important to give them and expose them to the feeling of air hunger to desensitize their body's reaction to the fear of suffocation because it's suffocation which is driving their symptoms. So the stress response, I would say that the biochemical dimension of breathing is vitally important. And the other aspect here is normally when you've got somebody with stress and anxiety and panic disorder, people with racing mind, and I'm not saying you don't have to be anxious to have your physiology in that increased stress response. But say, for example, you have somebody who's breathing upper chest. Why are they breathing using their upper chest? It's not ideal because the greatest concentration of blood flow is in the lower lobes. And upper chest is also telling the brain that things are not okay. But it's very common for people to breathe upper chest when they're feeling air hunger. So they're feeling air hunger during their everyday breathing. So they breathe faster in upper chest to compensate. So then we have to ask, well, what's driving the air hunger? This is when they're breathing from a biochemical dimension is not ideal. So if we just focus on the biomechanics without addressing the biochemistry, we may not get that long-term result. And the other thing is, if we just focus on addressing upper chest breathing and breathing with greater recruitment of the diaphragm, if that individual continues breathing through an open mouth, well, the mouth is engaging the upper chest. And to, in order to have good recruitment of the diaphragm, we need to breathe in and out through the nose. And I'll also I'll always say to my students, look down at your chest and take a breath through your mouth. And when you take a breath through your mouth, what part of the body has been activated? And it's the upper chest. So with breathing, then we have these three dimensions and they're all overlapping each other and so from when somebody's coming in i will look at their breathing from a biochemical point of view and give them exercise to target that from a biomechanical point of view give them exercise to target that and then we give them paced breathing so we slow down the respiratory rate to between 4.5 and 6.5 breaths per minute to help bring balance in the autonomic nervous system because it's not just a difficult situation that's changing our breathing patterns. So if we get stressed, of course, our breathing changes. Yes, and we do have some control over that. And some people are more resilient than others. And that will be influenced by how well they are breathing in their everyday. So if you have somebody that already is breathing fast in upper chest, they're already in that increased stress response. 
if they're confronted with a difficult situation, they are not going to cope with it so well as somebody with good functional breathing patterns. Now, I was this person here. And your resilience, your concentration, your focus, it's not ideal. <clears throat> so it's this is just, you can change this with breathing. So, yeah, my point went there in terms of what, what I was going to say. But, um, but <clears throat> this, yeah, the person's ability to cope with the difficult situation is really being influenced by their everyday breathing patterns. And then having some degree of control over your breathing when you're in that state, because the one thing about a human being, we cannot cope with long-term stress. And that's, that's known. We've never had to cope with long-term stress. We're, we're very fine with short-term stressors, psychologically, phys physical stresses, fine. Long-term stress is not, but we have some degree of control. So if anybody is feeling that their breathing is faster in upper chest and they're sighing a lot and they're in that stress response, sit back, just focus on breathing in and out through your nose. Take a soft breath in through your nose and a very gentle, relaxed and slow, gentle breath out. And really focus on slowing down the exhalation. And when you're breathing, have silent breathing. And even soften the breath somewhat that you're slowing down the speed of the air coming into the nose by about 20 to 30%. Okay. If you have air hunger, it's good. Now, if you have somebody with anxiety, they get anxious sometimes focusing on their breath. So what can you do? You could then do small breath holds. So you breathe in through the nose, out through the nose, pinch the nose and hold. Five, four, three, two, one. Let go, breathe in through the nose. So this way you can also help to stimulate the vagus nerve. And by holding the breath and the exhalation, you have to increase blood flow to the brain and oxygen delivery and normalize blood pH. And this has a calming effect on the brain itself. So there's, there's little tricks. And even I would say to somebody with anxiety, if you feel very anxious about focusing on your breath, which is a normal thing anyway with some people with anxiety, go for a walk with your mouth closed. It's absolutely the best breathing exercise ever. Because when you have your mouth closed, carbon dioxide is going to increase in the blood because your nose during wakefulness imposes a resistance to your breathing that's two to three times that of the mouth. Now, during sleep, it's different. Your mouth during sleep imposes a resistance to your breathing. So if you're breathing through your mouth during sleep, you're more likely to have sleep disorders. But during the nose, if you go for a walk with your mouth closed, carbon dioxide is going to increase in the blood. You know it's increasing because you feel air hunger. You know, because what's causing that sensation of air hunger? It's due to an accumulation of carbon dioxide. So you're going for your walk. You've got increased carbon dioxide in the blood. The increased carbon dioxide is helping to open up your blood vessels. It's improving your blood circulation. Also because of the Bohr effect, as carbon dioxide increases and blood pH drops, hemoglobin is releasing oxygen more readily to the working muscles. As you breathe through your nose, you're protecting your throat. You're protecting your lower airways, not your mouth. Your mouth is drying it out. Your mouth is cooling. And you can be more prone to exercise-induced bronchoconstriction if you're mouth breathing. By breathing through the nose, you've got better recruitment of your diaphragm. And it also helps to add an extra load to your breathing to help possibly strengthen and maintain form of the diaphragm. Now, if you have good function of the diaphragm, it provides stabilization for the spine. So 50% of people with lower back pain have dysfunctional breathing. Is it the lower back pain which is causing dysfunctional breathing? Or is it the dysfunctional breathing which includes upper chest breathing with reduced recruitment of the diaphragm? And because of that, it's the spine is not getting the stabilization that it should be getting. So yeah, it's it's um it's interesting, and that's just a humble nose, you know. Well, you've said so much there, uh, Patrick, and there are so many pearls there. Actually, coming back to the professor who said there was no difference between mouth breathing and nasal breathing, and you've used a word several times, which I think goes a long way to explain why they why they would say that. And you've used the word biochemistry. And biochemistry is a subject that we all studied in medical and dental school as undergraduates and could not wait to get rid of that <laughs> subject. They're like, just get, I, I've learnt all the processes, I've learnt all the things, I've memorised them, now I've passed that subject, great, now I can get on with being a doctor or a dentist. 
I don't have to worry about that anymore. And therein, I think, lies so many problems, uh, and you, you've alluded to them in breathing. We could talk about them in biochem, in, in nutrition as well, in a whole range of things. But that your, your reference to biochemistry time and time and time again is really the key here, isn't it? Because it's so, it has such a profound I think influence. It's, it's of, when I'm working with somebody, it's the one dimension that I really want to place the most emphasis on. Um, even though, mm. you know, when researchers are looking at breathing, they do, do look at breathing from a biochemical, biomechanical, and psychophysiological point of view. Hmm. So there's three sure. separate mechanisms, of course, but they are overlapped. Um, if, you, if you can improve the biochemistry, you're more likely to recruit, have good recruitment of the diaphragm, and also by improving the biochemistry. From a psychological point of view, the increased carbon dioxide helping to stimulate the vagus nerve, and that's what I'd say to people, like whatever breathing exercise you're doing, check out what's happening in your physiology. You know, tune into your body because you'll know the breathing exercises then that are working for you. And think of breathing exercises that they can have two effects on the body. They can either bring the body and mind into relaxation or they can stress you. So how do you bring the body and mind into relaxation? Nose breathing during sleep, tongue resting in the roof of the mouth. You tend to have a deeper sleep. You've got, you're less prone to sleep disorders you wake up feeling more refreshed. You should never wake up with a dry mouth in the morning. And number two, in terms of, and that point has eluded me now as well. So yeah, I'm definitely not firing on full cylinders today. Oh yes, no, That's I haven't. Right. That's right, okay, you're doing very So in terms of yeah. relaxation, okay, go, nose go. breathing first, light breathing. So mm -hmm. if you see somebody sitting down and during rest, they've got very noticeable breathing and faster breathing, it's not a good sign. Low breathing. So having less movement of the chest and more movement of the diaphragm. So an easy way to think about it is nose, light, slow, deep, LSD. So that can, that's an easy way to remember it. So when you, whenever you are breathing that way, you're activating the body's relaxation response. And if you want to stress the body and mind by practicing breathing exercises, you can do it two or three ways. You can hyperventilate. So you're taking a full big breath in, a full big breath out, and a full big breath in, a full big breath out. It's a stressor. So that can help with emotional release. But bear in mind that when you're stressing the body and mind, it's causing your blood vessels to constrict. It's causing a left shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. Less oxygen is getting throughout the body. And it can contribute to your airways constricting. And the second way, main way then to cause stress by using breathing techniques is to do a long breath hold. So if you take a normal breath in and out through your nose, you pinch your nose and hold, you just keep on jogging until you feel a strong air hunger, your blood oxygen saturation is dropping, and that will put you into an increased stress response. Now, there's a, there is a benefit for, for doing both. Like we will, we will look at the, the relaxation and then we stress the person. We relax them, we stress them, we relax them, we stress them. And it's almost that we're getting the autonomic nervous system, the automatic functioning of the body, and just giving it a little bit of a shake and that can improve resilience. And this can be measured, you know, objectively then via heart rate variability. So we can help to strengthen what's called the barrel reflex, help to improve vagal tone, and this will manifest then with um, improved heart rate variability, which is a feedback of resilience. Now, heart rate variability requires a little bit of explanation because I think it is a really important point and it's poorly understood. Can you just give us a little bit about heart rate variability 101? Yeah, I suppose a very mm. simple way to do it is just to locate, locate your pulse where, where you can get it just at the angle of your jaw. And while you're paying attention to the speed of your heart rate, also pay attention to your breathing. And during inhalation, just notice the speed of your heartbeat. And then during exhalation, notice the speed of your heartbeat. So during inhalation, the vagus nerve steps back. So it's more of a stress response and the heart rate should be faster. And then during exhalation, which is entirely under the control of the body's relaxation response, the heartbeat should slow down. So the timing between the heartbeats on the inhalation should be short and the timing between the heartbeats and the exhalation should be longer. In other words, your heartbeat should be faster during inhalation when the lungs are richest with oxygen and the heartbeat should be slower during exhalation when the lungs are richest with carbon dioxide. So the heart, the heart doesn't beat at the, well, it shouldn't 
beat at quite similar. There should be a variance there. And that variance is very good feedback of how well you were doing in terms of health, both physically and mentally, because people who are physically unwell and mentally unwell, they can be in that increased stress response and reduced heart rate variability. And a major part of this is the baroreflex, which is which are the, the pressure receptors in the major blood vessels in the aorta and the carotid arteries. And these pressure receptors are continuously monitoring your, your blood pressure. And you want these pressure receptors to be very sensitive so that if there's an increase of your blood pressure, the pressure receptors pick up on this and they send a signal via the brain to the blood vessels to dilate and the heart rate to come down so your blood pressure comes down. Or if there's a drop to your blood pressure, you want the pressure receptors to pick up in this and to send again a message via the brain to the blood vessels to constrict and the heart rate to increase to normalize your blood pressure. But we can lose sensitivity of the baroreflex. And that's evident when you look at people who are chronically unwell with diabetes, for example, with asthma, with COPD, with um, irritable bowel syndrome, with panic disorder, with anxiety, with depression. And, but we can influence this. And it's very important to have to bring balance back in the autonomic nervous system. I suppose the group of individuals where I'm really seeing an imbalance in the autonomic nervous system is people that are suffering with long COVID. Mm. And in terms of like, I, what I can do is only do the most gentlest of exercises. Their breathing rate can be so fast that they have difficulty even talking. They are running out of air. The length of their breath whole time is four seconds. That's having a normal breath in and out through your nose, pinching your nose and holding, four seconds of a breath hold before they need to breathe in again. They're struggling for breath. So they have really dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. And what we do is use the most gentlest of breathing exercises for very short periods of time with the hope that we can help to stimulate the vagus nerve. Now, humming can be helpful too, but because their breathing is so fast, they'll find it difficult to hum because they run out of air. Gargling, massage. So, you know, it's just, I think when, when we think of recovery, can the body heal itself if the body is in that increased stress response? Mm -hmm. You know, can we, is it worthwhile bringing the body back into balance, a balance between the rest and digest and stress response, which is very important because then we're setting the groundwork for healing mm. to take place. And that that uh, HRV or heart, heart rate variability, um, I think the higher the variability, the more, the more adaptive your nervous system is. And that's a good sign. So for example, 60 beats per minute, if, if they were one second every beat, that would be a very poor, in fact, no heart rate yes. variability. And that would show your autonomic nervous system just isn't adjusting second by second, whereas a higher heart rate variability is, is that. And you've mentioned the vagal nerve, vagus nerve a few times and improving vagal tone. That's another area that's really increased in knowledge in the last five or 10 years, isn't it? The, the understanding of the importance of the vagal, vagus nerve. Yeah, there's quite a lot. And even, you know, I suppose 10, 20 years, Paul Lehrer was um, one of the individuals, well, more so mm. focusing on heart rate variability. So the vagus nerve gets its name from a vagabond. So you have this nerve wandering throughout the human body, and it's innervating the major organs, including the, the diaphragm. And 80 to 90% of the communication by the vagus nerve is from the body up to the brain. So we can think of this nerve sending all of this wonderful information and we can help to influence the communication of the body to the brain via our breathing. So when you breathe light, you have to stimulate the vagus nerve. And this is not like the vagus nerve was first identified back in 1905. I think it was a researcher called Lowy, and he was experimenting with a frog or maybe it's 1913. And he was able to stimulate the vagus nerve and it secreted what he called was vagus, vagus stuff. And the heart rate slowed down. So this is not new. And there was a very interesting experiment done by a neuroscientist in New York called Kevin Tracy. He was experimenting with rats. And he wanted to stimulate the vagus nerve to stop inflammation. Now, his colleagues were outside in the corridor and they were apparently they were placing bets that it wasn't going to work. So what he proved was that if you can stimulate the vagus nerve, 
it can help to block harmful pro-inflammatory cytokines. So these are the, the messengers that are triggering inflammation. Now, and when we think as human beings, when we get into stress, especially long-term stress, it can trigger inflammation. So can we counter inflammation by stimulating the vagus nerve, which is going, which is going to block the triggers of inflammation? And like the promise here could be amazing if there was more, more work done on it and more research, especially with conditions that are they're chronic and there there's an inflammatory response there, such as asthma, which Australia, I think, like Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK have the highest instances of asthma in the world. It's about eight percent of the population. And I would talk as being that kid and teenager and young adult with asthma your sleep is impacted, but also you're more likely to be in that increased stress response. So here is inflammation of the airways, which could be helped by changing your breathing patterns. And it does need a lot more research. The only problem is, Ron, and I don't know if I'm being cynical, but it's very difficult to make money from teaching breathing exercises. Mm. You can't commercialize it. You can't put it into a product. Mm -hmm. But now what is happening actually is technology. So... You know, you think of us, we were on the cold face of teaching breathing for 20 years, working with clients like I was working with and still do with people with asthma, people with anxiety, people with um, sleep issues and then sports performance and learning all of that information. And then you have the technological sector, which is seeing all of this information and putting it into a gadget and putting in a lot of money. That way it's been commercial commercially made viable um, but I think that's what ha what has held breathing back a little bit in terms of the lack of research and the other thing is it's been seen too much of woo woo over here that was a mess you know it's not woo woo it's right down the center and like I spoke at the I'm probably talking too much now but no, no. I spoke at the World Sleep Congress in March of 20, 2016 March the 16th sorry March 16th of this year and it was attended by 2,700 sleep specialists, a huge event in Rome. And maybe I shouldn't have been saying what I was saying, but I said that sleep medicine hasn't moved on in 20 years. I said the failure of sleep medicine specialists to address mouth breathing during sleep, which is not being addressed still, has been a major, a major failure. And... Um, the, the lack of attention on breathing patterns during wakefulness and how it influences your breathing during sleep. And the sleep medicine has moved on a little bit since 2013 with a paper by Denny Eckhart on obstructive sleep apnea. And the only reason I talk about obstructive sleep apnea, it's so common. And if you have obstructive sleep apnea, physiologically you're going into that stress response and you're more likely to have reduced heart rate variability. And it impacts, of course, your cognitive function. So Denny Ackert identified that obstructive sleep apnea is not just anatomical, that there are four characteristics or traits. And the first one is peakrit. So peakrit is the pressure at which the airway collapses. And you want your airway to be able to withstand the high suction pressure. You don't want your airway, which I'm talking about the space at the back of the, the mouth, the throat, the, where the epiglottis is in the, well, the throat itself, but also the tongue falling into the throat. You don't want your airway to collapse at the slightest suction pressure. You need your airway to be able to withstand that. So that's peak crit. Peak, the say that again, peak. Peak, peak crit, peak crit. So it's the pharyngeal, so P for pharyn pharynx. Yep. The pharyngeal closing pressure. The second one, so he, he made it simple by using the word PAM, P-A-L-M. A is the second phenotype or characteristic, and this is arousal threshold. And low arousal threshold is when you're a very light sleeper. So somebody with insomnia, for example. And typically somebody with, uh, uh, who is a light sleeper, they don't have a very high severity of sleep apnea. And the reason being is because when they stop breathing during sleep or there is a reduction in the flow of their breathing during sleep, they wake up and then they don't score highly because they have so much sleep fragmentation. But this is the big problem. And when there was a study done with 6,000 individuals, and it was published by the American Thoracic Society, the individuals with low arousal threshold had an increased mortality over in other individuals with, say, for example, a person who was stopping breathing for a longer period of time. 
The third phenotype that he looked at is loop gain. And high loop gain implies that the chemosensitivity of your body to carbon dioxide is quite high. And you can recognize high loop gain by measuring your length of breath toll time during the day. So what this means is that if you've got a very strong reaction to the accumulation of carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is the drive to breathe, and you can imagine somebody is sleeping, their airway has collapsed, they stop breathing, carbon dioxide is increasing in the blood because it cannot leave the body through the lungs because they've stopped breathing. So carbon dioxide is increasing, but these people have a really strong reaction to the buildup of carbon dioxide. So when breathing kicks in, they resume breathing with such exaggerated ventilation that feeds into the next apnea. And also the brain doesn't send a signal to breathe when carbon dioxide then goes too low. So it's like a vicious circle. So high loop gain would imply that your breathing is a little bit all over the place. And then recruitment, muscle recruitment. So this is the M. So we have about 20 muscles in the throat and a subset of these muscles are responsible for helping to open and maintain an open airway. But these muscles get lazy. So how do we help? Didgeridoo playing, by the way, right mm. country for it here, um, <laughs> can help to reduce sleep apnea by, I think it was 50% in mild mm. to moderate. Just by and toning we, up those muscles. Yes. And mm. of course, myofunctional therapy as well. So those are the two main modalities for mm -hmm. that phenotype. So now sleep, sleep medicine now has evolved, even though I said it hasn't moved on, but it has evolved now because... If you then tailor a solution according to the phenotypes of that individual, you improve the outcome. So, for example, people with high loop gain don't do so well with mandibular advancement devices, and they don't do so well with surgery. And people who, in terms of have, have arousal threshold, it's very important to be able to help over stimulation of the mind, because if they have a racing mind and high stress levels, they can find a difficulty falling asleep, but also if their breathing is fast and hard, they're more likely to wake up during the middle of the night. How do you measure loop gain? One, there's only one paper on it by a Harvard doctor called Messino, and you can measure loop gain by the length of your breath hold time during wakefulness. Right now, so, you've mentioned breath hold a few times. Yes. Um, what what to do you when when you run classes? You see lots of people. What's a healthy breath hold? I mean, what, what should, you know, you go, wow, you're doing really well, or no, that's not good. I mean, I know four seconds would not be good. No, 25 seconds would be a healthy, well, ideally it's 40. But mm. say, for example, we're starting off with people who are unwell. We want to try and bring them up to 25 seconds. And this is when you take, so this breath hold is measured as follows. You take a normal breath in and out through your nose, and you pinch your nose and hold your breath and you time it in seconds until you feel the first definite desire to breathe or the first involuntary movement of your breathing muscles. And then you let go, but your breathing should be normal. So it's the length of time of your comfortable breath hold time. It's not a maximum. There was a study done by Kyle Kiesel. He looked at 51 individuals. He looked at their breathing from the three different dimensions and he concluded a simple and easy way to assess whether a person is breathing functionally is to measure the length of their breath hold time exactly as I described it. And wow. he said, if your breath hold time is above 25 seconds, you have an 89% chance that your breathing is functional. So it will come back then as an example. I am um, two days ago, there was somebody with sleep apnea. His breath hold time was 12 seconds. It's likely he is high loop gain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because he's got a, a strong chemo sensitivity to carbon dioxide. So he's holding his breath for 12 seconds. So he has to let go. Now you can imagine if he stops breathing during sleep and that carbon dioxide is accumulating. So how do you then reduce high loop gain? You reduce it with the breathing exercises during wakefulness mm -hmm. because that then is going to increase your breath hold time, which in turn is going, you're going to have lighter and slower breathing during sleep. Now, I know you've also written a book called The Oxygen Advantage, and you've mentioned it in passing a little earlier. People may have missed it. And that is during sport, we've, yes. we're kind of told, breathe in through the mouth. You know, you really draw it in. And yet and yet, there's a, another way of looking at this. You've written about yes. it. Can you give us a little bit of – talk to us about that. Yeah, I think it's very important to breathe in and out through the nose during exercise. I do understand that when exercise intensity gets too high, you do have to switch to mouth breathing. 
But we should be thinking of the nose as it's the primary organ in the human body to do all of that work to the air before it comes into the lungs. And there's about, like Morris Cottle said, there were 30, Dr. Morris Cottle is an ENT back in the 1970s. He said the human nose is responsible for 30 functions. So during physical exercise, we would always encourage people to do their walking with their mouth closed and their tongue resting up in the roof of the mouth. Athletes, when they're warming up, athletes during low to moderate exercise to nasal breathe, even to the point that you feel that little bit of a stronger air hunger. It's not about pushing yourself until you go blue, but it's about challenging yourself to do physical exercise and to allow your nose to determine the intensity of what exercise you're doing. And then you've got a reduced risk of overtraining. You've got a better recovery. You've got reduced lactic acid. But here's the thing wrong. If you get somebody breathing through their nose for six weeks during physical exercise, their body adapts to lighter breathing during exercise. Now they can do that same exercise with less ventilation. So there's more reserve in the tank. So their fitness levels are improving. But think of the other benefits, protection of the airways, increased oxygen delivery, increased oxygen uptake, increased tolerance to carbon dioxide, better recruitment of the diaphragm, but also the connection between the brain and, sorry, the nose and the brain. So researchers in Israel, they looked at visual spatial awareness. And visual spatial awareness is that Say, for example, you're on a football field and you're, you're watching, you're, you have your focus on the ball, but also at the same time, you're watching everything that's going on around you. That increases with nasal breathing versus mouth breathing. And this might be something that is throughout our evolution. We select our partners based on the senses that are originating from the nose, not from the mouth. Our memory is higher with nasal breathing. They've done experiments. When you breathe in through your nose, when you're exposed to information, breathing in through the nose increases your attention versus your mouth. So there's so many different little things there that are very interesting with it. But I'll come back to as well, functional breathing and functional movement go together. And when individuals were assessing using the functional movement screen, 87.5% of people who pass the functional movement screen have functional breathing. So in other words, they're breathing from a biochemical and biomechanical point of view is okay. And what would imply then if, that if you have an athlete with dysfunctional breathing, they're more breathless on the field, they're gassing out too soon, but also their states of mind, because the harder and the faster you're breathing, it can be putting you into this fight or flight response. It's driving up your heart rate, your recovery is reduced. So there's these things that be, you know, an athlete with dysfunctional breathing, it's going to hold them back. And it's really important for that athlete to think about your performance on the field is not just because due to your physical performance, your breathing is a huge role, your sleep is a huge role, and your mental states have a huge role. And we have to ask the question, can we access flow state, which, which is this state of mind where, whereby we are fully absorbed in what we are doing? that there is no differentiation between the individual and the game, that they're so immersed in what they are doing. In order to access flow, we need concentration. But in order to have concentration, we need functional breathing and we need optimal sleep. So again, it comes full circle. And you mentioned it takes six weeks for an athlete to train with their mouth closed to yes. really do that to get on top of that it's not just i'm going to go out for a run now but i'm going to really make sure oh no that didn't work i, I tried to breathe through my nose but it just didn't work what do well, you do do you, do you tape your mouth up we want we should talk a little bit about mouth taping but would you just tape your mouth up while you train some people could we brought out a sports tape um which is a tape that surrounds the mouth now we also use it for sleep i'm not sure if you're aware of it but uh we have a tape because we have a problem with kids for so many years because we wanted them to restore nasal breathing. Hmm. And we were getting fearful of putting the tape across their lips, mm -hmm. you know. And so I brought out this new tape, which is my own tape. It's it's called my own tape. Ah, yes, and, we've used uh, Patrick. Oh, used we it. use it in our practice. Oh, it's wow. like reproducing muscular, what's yes. lying underneath, the orbicularis oris. Yes, yes. I spoke with <laughs> physios brilliant. and they, they said they could could be helping to stimulate the orbicular sorus muscle, which, which is great. I think when you, when you start doing your physical exercise with your mouth closed, just understand that, yes, the air hunger is going to be a bit stronger. 
And originally you might have to slow down a little bit, but bear in mind that that air hunger is not because your oxygen levels have dropped, it's because your carbon dioxide has increased, which in turn is going to cause more oxygen to be delivered throughout the body. So it's just a case of, you know, adding an extra load to your body by breathing in and out through the nose, and then your body adapts to that because your body then adapts to a higher tolerance of CO2 in the blood, carbon dioxide. So then you can sustain nasal breathing easier. And the one thing about the human nose is the more you use it, the better it works for you. Now, when you start doing your physical exercise, your nose now starts getting runny. So you have to bring a tissue with you. Um, if you're an elite athlete, we're not expecting you to do all of your breathing in the natural nose. But we're, we would absolutely encourage you to adopt nasal breathing where you can to get those adaptations. Hmm. Well. It's uh, that that is brilliant, and must say, congratulate the Maya tapes are wonderful uh, li- little uh, invention. Thanks. I I didn't realise that was your invention, Patrick. Yeah, well done. It's, yeah, and that's it's been it's become popular. We didn't think it was either. Like we only brought it out for children, and and then for the adults, adults with anxiety, we always had problems too. You know, um, because they would be apprehensive for you know obvious reasons about taping their mouth closed. So, and I think getting to sleep run. Breathing in and out through the nose is absolutely so imperative, even just for dental health. I wrote an article recently, and I've written a couple of books now since the Oxygen Advantage as well. I wrote a book called The Breathing Cure because mm-hmm. I wanted to kind of, I wanted to delve deeper into the science. So it's a 190,000 word book. It's wow. quite scientific. And I looked at breathing across a number of different conditions, including epilepsy, uh, diabetes. And I also spoke about the role of the dentist in sleep medicine and this is another thing that is really bugging me because i'm almost 50 years of age and my age group and male we're prime candidates for obstructive sleep apnea as we get older but i haven't i've only been to a medical doctor once in 20 years and i'm no different than any of the other males out there we don't tend to go to medical doctors but we go to our dentist every six months and if i'm lying back in the chair wouldn't it be wonderful if the dentist was able to say, Patrick, I see you've got a really high narrow palate. I see your jaws mm-hmm. are set back. I see you've got indentations in your tongue. And this dentist is able to spot all of the risk factors and say, Patrick, you know what? You kind of have some of the signs there. It might be good for you to go and do a sleep study. Or the dentist sees the kids coming in and spots all of these things. And I don't understand why dentists haven't picked up on this. It's really, really important. Because hmm. we are we are just falling through, males especially. We're falling between the two stools of medicine and dentistry. And I know that, you know, if these two disciplines came together, because sleep is not just the domain of medicine. I wrote about this in the book, and I think it's so important that the dental industry steps up to the mark here. I understand that there are brilliant individuals like you, but... It, they are not all like that. Well, uh, that's a hell of a note to finish on, Patrick, but we've covered so many. You've, you've given us such a great overview and given us such great information here today, and we're going to, of course, have links to your website and your books. Uh, I'm definitely going to be looking up that breathing cure. That I would sounds... send you a copy. <laughs> well, I'll send you a copy of my book, but it's uh, but but anyway, so great to reconnect with you, Patrick, and, and uh, gee, if this is you with... Uh, Jet lag, I, I can't wait. We'll have to do this again when you're on on what you call top of your game. Thank you so much for Thanks. joining us. Thanks today. very much, Ron. It's a pleasure. Well, there is always so much to learn in breathing, and uh, I'm, I've been studying it for years. I'm studying it right now. I'm doing a postgraduate, uh, well, a program, a six-month program to increase my knowledge of it. And uh, every time I talk to someone about breathing, I learned something new and I thought that PALM model, that P-A-L-M, pharyngeal collapsibility, that's the P, and that's what happens as we get older. Our muscle tone becomes less toned and our abil- and the likelihood of our airway to collapse is greater. Um, A stands for arousal threshold, how easily you are aroused from sleep. The L is, a, is something that I am really going to need to explore. Loop gain is an, an, an engineering term about feedback loops and when output is more than input and, and uh, it's a whole other area. Uh, it's about the chemosensitivity 
of receptors in our body to carbon dioxide level, but I need to explore that. That's a whole new area. And the M of PALM stands for muscle recruitment because when we breathe, uh, ideally, we there are many muscles that are used, but the diaphragm is the main breathing muscle, along with perhaps intercostal muscles in the ribs. But many of us use our neck and shoulder and breathe very shallowly. And uh, that is uh, a, a problem in and of itself, because if you've got a whole set of lungs, why not use all of them? And the other thing I find amazing, I keep learning more about the diaphragm, and I know that the diaphragm is important for lung function. It's also important for lymphatic drainage. It also is a great way of stimulating the internal organs of the abdomen. I know when you use your diaphragm, your pelvic floor muscles become more toned, and that's important if you've had children or as we get older, um, and particularly if we've had u urinary incontinent problems and prostate problems. So using the diaphragm, but also to stabilize the lumbar spine. I mean, it just keeps getting, the body just keeps getting more and more connected, and I keep learning more and more about it. I hope you do too. Look, we'll obviously have links to Patrick Sight and his wonderful book, books, The Breathing Cure and The Oxygen Advantage. Hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.